you know, there's a lot of restaurants that are closed on Monday night because nobody wants to go out to eat. January is kind of that month. There's not a lot of stuff going on, but for the church, that helps us to kind of reset, and we really need to reset after 2020. I'm believing by faith that sometime in this year, COVID's going to be in the rearview mirror. I'm believing that. I'm not saying I'm prophesying that, but I'm just believing that. I'm an eternal optimist. Eeyore is not my name. I'm more like Tigger, and I believe, you know, I mean, you know, I just believe, and we're going to be able to get back to normal, whatever. I know it's a new normal. What it's look, this brother, it was mentioned at the back to church or back to end of the year revival. It is a new normal. We'll, we'll never be the same. This is like life after 9 11. We'll never be the same. There are things we don't even know all the areas that COVID 19 has changed our world. There's no way to know. But we'll never be the same. But the church will always be powerful. I don't. Honestly, I'm an American through and through. Just let me say some stuff we probably can't say on Sunday. I'm an American through and through. I love my country. I love the country that we had before COVID. It's probably not coming back. Okay, now I sound like you are, but I'm a, I'm a realist as well. But what we need to understand, because all of our life, we have done church in an environment of a certain American culture we struggle thinking, how is, the church, how is this going to affect the church? The church is always stronger when it's not in comfortable situations. The church isn't going away. Matter of fact, we're going to be stronger. A few years ago, I was with a bishop in, uh, uh, it was in Wisconsin, Sister Tracy, and in a very godless city and powerful church, unbelievable church. And I had a relationship with that church. I went there about three or four years in a row preaching revivals. And one day I asked him, how in the world do you build a church like that in this town? I'm coming from Memphis. I'm just a Bible Belt thinking. He said, well, that's the only kind that survives here. So let me just tell you something. The only kind of churches that will survive, apostolic moving forward, are strong churches. And we're already there, so we're going to keep driving into that. Don't worry about the church. Now, I'm mourning for our country. I absolutely do. But don't worry about the church. The church is going to, I'm telling you, we're going to be strong and we're going to do exploits. Great things are going to happen. Brother Batson, I'm preaching too much. I'm not on the docket. Put your hands together and welcome our friend. That first session was incredible. Whatever God gives you, take it away. Oh, let's give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. Give your pastor a good hand this morning. How awesome is that? Just to have the vision uh, to have these types of days and, and uh, pray those types of prayers is, is awesome. And uh, you have great leadership, and I know you guys know that, and uh, just a great church. Uh, thank you again for the invitation to be here. It's in these types of settings where God can do mighty, mighty things. And uh, Acts chapter 2 uh, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost probably kind of looks something like this right here. And the Bible says where they were all sitting and they were sitting with a certain amount of expectation and uh, then all of a sudden something supernatural began to happen in that midst. And uh, I'm believing today that something supernatural is taking place uh, in this community, in this city. And uh, God is working. Never, never believe, as, as the pastor just said, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. It can fight, it can come against, and it certainly will and has done that. But the gates of hell cannot prevail. You're sitting amongst, not this building, but the, the, the group of people. You're sitting in something that hell just shakes its head. It has thrown everything it can. Amen. It has thrown everything it can to certain people. There's people that suffered death and, and loss of loved ones and sickness and cancer and all kinds of crazy things that have happened and they're still getting up and still going to church on a Saturday. You've got to be kidding me. Go to church on a Saturday from 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock and, 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 and hell knows I'm no match for that church. <coughs> but he's still going to fight, amen? <coughs> he's still still going to come against us but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world amen you believe that won't you say that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world and, and we're thankful today 
Amen. I want to uh, talk about something uh, just kind of I, I, when, when Brother Smith asked me to be here, this is the very first thing that, that come into my spirit uh, on, I believe it was Monday when he asked or was speaking of it, and then we didn't find out till Wednesday if it was going to be a, a certain. And I felt like that the Lord had kind of laid this in, in my heart and my spirit. And uh, so I want to I wanna talk to us a little bit about that today. The Bible says in Isaiah 61, if you, if you want to turn there with me, you can. Uh, Isaiah 61. Again, thank you so much for being here and uh, taking of your Saturday. You could have been doing other things. You could have been mopping the floors, you know, washing the car, you know, washing dishes, you know, uh, you know, going to the mall, whatever it is you enjoy doing. You could have been doing that today, but but you've chosen to come to the house of the Lord, and uh, and we're thankful for that. And uh, those that are watching online, God bless you. Thank you uh, for those that have watched. And uh, we're, we're, just, uh, we're just excited to be here. Uh, if you would turn in your Bibles with me to Isaiah 61 and verse 1. The Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because... There's a purpose, there's a reason for this Spirit of God that is settled. The Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. Look at what happens here. To give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Verse 4, and they shall build up the old waste, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. The prophet Isaiah, so eloquently speaking to us and telling us that the Spirit of the Lord has come upon me for a reason, for a purpose so that I can preach these things to the hearer, that I can speak these things to the hearer. Lord, we thank you today for allowing us to be here. We pray, Lord, that you'd speak to every person, every heart, every mind, every soul, every spirit, in the wonderful name of Jesus, and everybody said amen. I want to talk to us for just a little bit of time on the handling of his presence, the handling of his presence. All of these wonderful blessings happen when we allow the Spirit to get on us and to bring revelation to us. I think it goes without saying that we know is their purpose for being here today is that prayer. Prayer would uh, be stirred up in us. The Spirit of prayer uh, would be stirred up in us. And when the Spirit begins to uh, be stirred up and begins to manifest in the room, in the building, in, in, in whatever setting it may be, all of these blessings begin to be poured out. Good tidings being preached unto the meek. Binding of the brokenhearted. Liberty to the captive. Opening of the prison to them that are bound. Comfort comes to those that mourn. Beauty for ashes. Oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Then verse 4 speaks about the building up of the old waste and to raise up those things that were in desolation, repairing the waste cities. The prophet Isaiah is telling these things begin to happen when the Spirit begins to move. When the Spirit begins to move into the room, these things begin to happen, begins to bring blessing upon the people when we allow the Spirit, even in this setting, in tomorrow's setting, in church tomorrow and church on Tuesday night, and, and in, the, in the days to come, when, when we allow the Holy Ghost to begin to move in our midst, things start happening. Things begin to happen. So I, I say this today with all due respect. If you need joy, get in the Spirit. 
Amen. If you need some relief in your, in your mind, get in the spirit for a few moments. There is a promise that tells us that, that these things are coming. If you need some comfort today, the spirit, that it will comfort those that are mourning. It doesn't necessarily take everything away. The Bible says that the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness or the beauty for ashes or the oil of joy for mourning. When I come outside this morning, the hotel, it was, it was cold outside. It, it, it was pretty chilly outside. And, and for that cold, I had a coat. So I put that, cold, that coat on for the cold. It, it didn't take the cold away. It, it didn't make it all of a sudden be 85 degrees and sunny and we're in Florida, but, but I was given a coat because it was cold. We, we have been given beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning. We've been given the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So if you're here today and you need, you need some help, then, then, then you ought to praise a little bit. If you're here today and you're feeling down and out, you ought, to, you ought to worship a little bit. You ought to magnify a little bit. Let the spirit get stirred up in this place. Let, let the Holy Ghost get stirred up in this place. You have to forgive me if I start preaching. Lord, I, you sure? Is that all right? I get a little excited. I don't know what's going on. Amen. We, we need comfort. We need help. We need strength then we can get the Spirit of God moving in this place. You feel like that maybe parts of your life has been wasted. Get in the Spirit. God will show you how good He's really been. You feel like that life has been unfair? Get, get in the Spirit for a few moments. You'll realize how blessed you really are. I, I can say this with assurance. God can do more for you in five minutes. God can do more for you in five minutes that then someone can do in a lifetime. When I get into the presence of the Lord and I get away from the presence of everything else, when I get into the presence of the Lord and I take my eye off of the distraction of the day, my expectations begin to change. Revelation begins to happen in my life. It's when I get into the presence of the Lord, when God starts moving, things start happening. Amen. When God starts moving in our midst, things begin to happen. When, when the Spirit starts moving, this happened from the very beginning. You can look in your Bible for yourself to see if I'm telling you the truth. In Genesis chapter 1, in verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. How many of you believe that's Genesis 1 and 1? In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And in verse 2, the Bible says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It doesn't go to verse 3. It stays in verse 2. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Then verse 3 says, And God said, Let there be right in the middle of darkness, right in the middle of void, right in the middle of what looks like there was no hope. He couldn't even get out of the same verse before the Spirit started moving. He said, I can't even go to verse 3. I got to allow the verse, the Spirit to start moving in verse 2 where all the void is, where all the darkness is. And when the Spirit starts moving, God said in verse 3, let there be. Let there be. We need some let there be moments in this house today. We need some let there be moments before we leave on this Saturday morning. I believe if the Holy Ghost gets moving in this house, let there be healing in this house. Let there be deliverance in this house. Let faith rise in this house. Let help come in this house. Let forgiveness come in this house. Let the Holy, that all happens with the Spirit. I don't know about you, but I feel the Holy Ghost moving in this room. I feel the Spirit moving in this room. Hallelujah, let there be salvation. Let there be joy. Let there be miracles. Let there be favor. Let there be whatever you may need in your life. It all starts when the Spirit begins to move. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, where the Spirit of the Lord is, 
there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, the devil's got to go. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, all of that hatred's got to go. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, all depression has to go. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, all sickness has to go. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, division has to go. There's something about the moving of the Spirit of Almighty God. Hallelujah. It's the only thing that, that's going to keep us alive. It's the only thing that's going to help us. The pastor was just speaking about what 2020 ha has done. And, when, and, 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 what it, and I mentioned it earlier, what we feel all around us. It's, it's got to be the help of God. It's got to be the presence of God. L listen to me. If a, if a, man, if a man made it then a, then a, and it breaks, then a man can fix it. Amen? If a man made it and it breaks, then a man can fix it. But if God made it, only God can fix it. Amen? If God made it, and we're too busy trying to look around, trying to be fixed by something on this earth, we're looking to one another, Pastor, can you fix me? Pastor, can you help me? Yeah, we can pray for you, and he's gonna pray for you. He, he can visit with you, and, and he can try to encourage you. But if there is something inside of you that's broken, only the Creator, the one that made you, can fix that. So get your eyes off of another person. Get your eyes off of another human. And as David said, I lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. My strength is going to come from God. My deliverance is going to come from God. My forgiveness is going to come from God. My salvation is going to come from God. Quit looking around at things in this world hoping that it can make you better. It can fix you. It can help you. If you're going to be helped, it's going to come from the creator of the universe. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. My, my, my. Man, I feel, I feel good in here. The only thing that's going to keep me from preaching a long time is a barbecue rib or a chips and salsa. I don't know. Acts 17 and 24. L listen to this verse of Scripture. I, I, all of you are so, uh, so, this church is a deep church. It's a Bible. Uh, you've got great teaching. Great. So I know when I make some of these statements, y'all are like, well, that ain't impressive. I'm just going to remind you again if that's all right. I heard that before. It's okay. You listened to there's a tear in my beard before too. You listened to it again. Why is it we expect, now this is a side commercial here. Why is it we expect a preacher to blow our minds every day when that praise team sings the same five songs? We want the preacher to preach something that blows our minds. Give me something new and you singers and musicians. Let's sing Here I Am to Worship again. That's a joke. I'm part of the praise team at church. I'm part of the problem. So, But look at what Acts 17. I know you guys have heard it, but look, but look at this. Acts 17 and 24. God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Verse 25, neither is worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. In other words, he's God. He don't need anything. He's the Lord of the heaven and the earth. He don't need your praise. He don't need your worship to be any more God. If nobody ever worshiped again, he's still God. If nobody ever praised again, he still possesses the same power. He, he doesn't, he doesn't, that's what the scripture said. He said, he is not worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. I'm going to get to prayer here in just a minute. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and hath made of one blood of all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before and appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Verse 27, that they may seek the Lord if haply they may feel after him and find him though he be not far. Look at what the scripture says from every one of us for in him we live and move and have our being. The Bible said if you'll just happily do this 
If you'll just get happy about feeling after me, he said, I'll be found of you. It, it doesn't matter if you're sitting on the back row or if you're sitting on the front row. It doesn't matter. If you'll just feel for him, he is not far from every single person. So if you're sitting in this room and say, well, right now, I don't feel anything. If you'll just feel around for just a moment, the presence of the Lord is not far from anybody. It doesn't matter if you were good last night or if you were bad last night. If you've done everything right this week or you dropped the ball this week, he said, if somebody will just feel for me, if somebody will just reach for me, if somebody will just pray to me, if somebody will just call upon me, he said, I'm right there. I'm right there to help every single person that's in the room. He said, I, I don't need your worship to be God. I don't need your praise to have any more power. But, but if you're just feeling after me, I'm gonna show up. If you'll just reach for me for just a few moments, I'll help you with that heaviness. I'll help you with that despair. I'll help you that, that, that feels really weak. If you'll just feel after me, that's what, happened when we, that's what happens when we get down and we bow our knees in prayer. We may not feel anything in the first 10 seconds. We may not feel anything in the first five minutes. We may not even feel anything in the first 15 minutes or the first 30 minutes, but if you'll keep keep reaching for him, if you'll keep feeling for him, if you'll keep calling upon the name of Jesus, it won't be, I don't know how it happens, but something begins to happen in the atmosphere. Something begins to happen in the spirit realm. And those eyes that were dry, they begin to moisten up. And that heart that was full of despair begins to feel some relief. And that mind that is confused begins to feel something happen. I'll tell you what it is. Some Somebody's reaching for him. Somebody's feeling for him. Somebody said, I'm gonna stay here until he moves upon me. Hallelujah. Could you lift up your hands all over this building? Could you just feel after him? Come on, could you just feel after him for just a moment? Hallelujah. 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 I think that everybody here has probably got up in the middle of the night. If you haven't, you, you wait a few years, it'll happen to you. You'll have to get up in the middle of the night and, and you don't want to have to, you don't want to have to turn the lights on. So you learn to feel. Well, there's a dresser. I know if I go this way a little bit, I'll miss from kicking that little toe on the edge of the bed. And your eyes are half shut, but you're feeling in the darkness you're feeling and then you finally get to the place where you know this, this is the place that I need to be. I'm telling somebody it can get dark sometimes. It, it can get to where the lights are not shining but if you'll just feel around if you'll just feel around there's going to come a spot. Oh I remember this place I remember the victory that came at this pew before. I remember standing in the altar at this particular place. I know it's dark around right now but if I can get Get back into the house of the Lord. If I can get back into a prayer room, if I can get back with the people of God, I, I, I may be feeling, but I can. If I can get back there, I'll know I'm in the place that God is going to answer me once again. Hallelujah. That's what happens when we begin to pray, when we begin to seek after him. I, I pray today, I pray today that, that you, won't, you won't take me wrong when I say this, but in order for the church to survive, but not only survive, but to thrive in the perilous times, then the church has got to get it right. We got to get back to the place that if God isn't leading this thing, that it's not going in the right direction. That if the spirit isn't leading this thing, then it's not going in the the right direction. If the Holy Ghost ain't moving upon us, then it's not going to go in the right direction. I can't plan it out far enough. I can't plan it out perfect enough. We can't practice it enough. We cannot get it right. If the Spirit doesn't move in this house, they won't be drawn into this house. If the Holy Ghost ain't moving in this house, no sins are going to be forgiven. If the Holy Ghost ain't moving, then no people, oh Lord, how mercy. We got to get the Holy Ghost Ghost moving. We got to get the spirit moving and that all happens when we call upon the name of the Lord.
with everything that's within us. We gotta get the spirit moving in this place. I, I cannot imagine having church any other way. Some will think that we're too emotional. I don't think we're too emotional. Some will tell me that we push praise and worship too much. I don't think that we push praise and worship too much. L listen, listen, hear me. I, 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 please hear me right now. I, I'm not interested in Pentecostal traditions. Man, hear me out. Don't throw me out yet. I'm, I'm interested in Pentecostal power, but I'm not interested in Pentecostal tradition. I don't want my praise and worship to be a result of a cheerleader. Is that all right? I don't want the only time I lift my hands is because somebody says, come on, lift your hands and worship God. Pentecostal traditions are this. We clap our hands. We lift our hands. We speak out with a loud voice, praises unto God. We even dance a little bit. I've even seen some people run the aisles this week in revival. We leap up and down. Many outward expressions of what we call worship and praise. And every one of these are biblical as well. But every one of these can be done on command. Amen. But I don't need a commandment to worship God. I don't need somebody to tell me to praise God. All I have to do is think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me that when I was lost he reached in and pulled me out that when I was a pit he didn't walk by and leave me there when I was addicted he set me free when I was sick he healed my body when I was in the hospital he pulled me out when I was broke he fixed me when I think of the goodness of Jesus everybody in this house ought to stand up at least once then you ought to lift up your hands and say God when I think about what you've done for me when I think about where you brought me from when I think about how you put me back together and put my family back together and healed my crazy mind and healed my crazy family oh and forgave me of those crazy sins I have to worship you I have to praise you I have to leap I have to dance I have to magnify I have to give I have to pray Hallelujah, because God has been too good to me. Sometimes we need to stop and just ponder the question, where would I be if it wasn't for the Lord? Where would I be if it wasn't for the Lord? David said it this way in Psalms 40 and 2. He said, he brought me out also of a horrible pit out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise under our God. The world didn't pull you out of the pit. The world put you in the pit. Amen. The enemy didn't try to pull you out of despair. The enemy put you in that despair. The enemy didn't try to save you. He tried to kill, steal, and destroy you. It's the grace of God that pulled you out of the pit. It's the mercies of God that saved you. It's the goodness of God that pulled you up to the front of a building and began you to lift your hands and repent and get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. David said, he's the one that done that. And because he done that, I will praise him. Praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Why? Because he's the one. He's the one that brought me out of the mess that I'm in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't let it be said that somebody else encourages me to worship. Let it be said he remembered. I remembered where I was. She remembered where she was. And the words that come out of our mouths, if it wasn't for God, I was lost, but God. I was bound, but God. I was dying, but God. They gave up hope, but God. Anybody in this room that others gave up on you, but it was only God? Amen. Anybody of your family members given up on you, but God didn't give up on you? We preached to the, to the ladies' prison. We've been a part of several ladies' prison conferences, even a men's prison conference in, in Mississippi, and, and you're looking at a whole room full of people that everybody gave up on them. Society gave up on them. The judge gave up on them. The, the jury gave up on them, and, and they put them, in a, put them in a place that they, 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 they think they're going to try to make them better. Ain't making nobody better. They're just only housing them and, and not really doing it unless God gets a hold of them. I, I, I'm telling somebody today, this world can give up on you. Your family can give up on you. Society can give up on you, but God will will never, ever give up on you. But if we're not careful, we'll have an outward expression 
with our traditions, but we have no power. If we're not careful, Jesus addressed this in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8 when he said, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Jesus talked about that. I, I, you know, I'm not talking about commentary from, from, from all of the smart ones. I'm going to give you my commentary on those verse. If you don't put anything in, you ain't going to get anything out. That's my comment. Jesus said the people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In other words, Jesus was saying, if you don't mean it, I won't show up. If, you, if you're not sincere about this, if, if, you don't, if, you, if you're just going through the motions and going through the traditions of the church, then, then that's why they'll walk out and never be changed. But if you'll, with a sincere heart, seek me, with a sincere heart, call upon me, then that's when my spirit will begin to show up. Ladies and gentlemen, we are fighting a spiritual battle. We are fighting against things that we do not even see. We are fighting against spirits and spiritual wickedness in high places. We are fighting against vile and perverse spirits. We are fighting against things. We are literally fighting for our very survival in the church. So let me tell somebody today, the church has got to step up in its consecration. The church has got to step up in its dedication. The church has got to step up. Listen, if hell is going to unleash its most vile attacks, then the church better be ready to stand up. Amen. If all the evil in the world is being released, then the church better start praying. The church better start calling upon the Lord. If there's ever been a time to come together and bind together in unity, it's right now. It's 2021. If we're going to push back against the forces of darkness, if we're going to push back against the forces of this world, it's time to come together. It's not time to find fault with one another. It's time to find favor with one another. It's not time to point out what's wrong with the church but find out what's right with the church it's not time to try to question everything it's time to come into commandment with the word of the lord god i'm going to seek you i'm going to pray i'm going to worship until there is a power that comes upon us once again until there's an anointing that comes upon us once again but that's not going to happen just because we say or want it to happen it's going to happen when we make it to happen the church has got to step up to the challenge. We must have God. We must have a demonstration of God in our midst. We must have a divine visitation of his presence in our midst. We've got to have it. 2 Samuel chapter 6, starting at verse 1, after a great victory over the Philistines, the Bible says again, David gathered together all of the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal to Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God. Everybody say the ark was in the wrong place. The ark was in the wrong place. The presence of God, the representation of the presence of God was not in the place it was supposed to be. The Bible says that after David had, had a great victory over the Philistines that he chose these these 30,000 chosen men of Israel, David said, we're going to get the presence of God. We're going to get the ark of God. The Bible says in verse 3, after they got to the particular place where the ark of God was, verse 3, and they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab that was at Gibeah and Uzzah and Ohio and the sons of Abinadab drave the new cart. A couple of things, just a couple of things and I'll, I'll be finished here. Number one, chosen Chosen men of Israel. Not everyone is interested in bringing in the presence of the Lord. Pastor, you know that. You know that. I know that. If you've been in church for any amount of time, Brother Marshall, you know that. Brother Joke, you know that. That not everybody is interested in the move of God. There are some people that's interested in just coming in and sitting and say, well, they took my name on the roll. I was there, you know. I'm gonna throw, I'll put this you know, in the offering, and we're thankful for that. We're, we're thankful for people that are faithful to come. And, 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 but they, uh, uh, I was talking to a young man one time, and, and he told me this. He said, I wasn't raised that way. We was talking about, we was talking about a move of the Spirit, a move of the Holy Ghost. And, and this young man told me, he said, I wasn't raised that way. I'm talking about a Pentecostal guy. He said, he said I was raised in the church that if the Spirit of God moved, then so be it. But if the Spirit of God didn't move, then so be it. 
Didn't have to have it. But when we get used to not having the presence of the Lord, that's when we start to do it on our own ability. Listen, there's some mighty talented people in the church, mighty gifted people in the church, but the moment we think that we can do this without God, when we think, well, I don't need to pray, I, I can play good enough. I, I don't need to pray, I, I can sing good enough. I, I don't need to get to church early and dedicate, I, 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 I am eloquent enough, I, can, I am good on my feet, I can speak it out. It's when we get to that place that we start getting in trouble. But David recognized, I won this battle on my own ability. But the presence of God that represents victory is not where it's supposed to be. We're going to go get it. The Bible says that 30,000 chosen men, not everybody is interested in bringing in the presence of God. But thanks be to God, there's some people here on a Saturday morning, and this is nothing against those that are not here. But thanks be to God that those that are here on a Saturday morning is showing God, God, I want to be where you are. God, I'm interested in, oh Lord, I'm interested in you leading this church. I'm interested when I sing the anointing falling. I'm interested that when I preach and play that the anointing of God falls. Thanks be to God there is still some people that's interested in the presence of the Lord. But this is not about a show. This is not about being good enough. This is not about somebody put me on a bigger stage with brighter lights. No, no, no. David said it was in my ability that I beat the Philistines, but the presence of the Lord is not where it's supposed to be. You can do a lot on your own, but you'll never have complete victory until the power of God rests upon you. You may sing like a bird. You may play like B.B. King. I don't know. You may have enough talent, but people are not going to be delivered through your ability. People are not going to be set free through your talent. People are not going to be lifted with heaviness through your preaching. It's going to be through the anointing of the Holy Ghost. It's going to be through the power of Almighty God. And that comes when we pray and when we seek for the real presence of God. Hallelujah. So there are some people that are interested in the presence of God. Some people are satisfied with just going to church. I'm not, I, 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 God bless them people. But there are some people that are desperate. There are some people that are desperate. There are still some men like your pastor and pastor's wife that are desperate for a move of God. There are still some leaders at this great church that will look around and say, God, if this is not your house, it's just another building. If you're not moving our young people, it's just another gathering. If you don't take over Sunday service, it's just another community setting. But if we can get God in this house, if we can get the presence of the Lord in this house, if we can get the ark of God in this house, people will be healed. People will be set free. Devils will be cast out. Blessing will come. Chains will be broken. But that only happens when the real presence of God shows up in our midst. Hallelujah. I believe I'm preaching today and I'm supposed to be teaching or talking. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, but I believe I'm talking, teaching, whatever I'm doing, preaching to some people in this house right now that is ready for what the pastor preached, what he, excuse me, what he prayed just a few moments ago. Some of you roll your eyes when you hear 25 churches around the city, but God doesn't. God's looking down saying, I, I'm, I'm ready to pour out. God, we're ready for this building to be filled. We're ready for the next building to be filled. We're ready to have something on our own. There's some people in this room that if you'd bind together in prayer and you would activate your faith, God is going to blow your mind. God's going to blow your mind in what he wants to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse number three, the second thing the Bible says and they set the ark of God on a new cart. It is possible to desire the visitation of God but go about it the wrong way. I'm sincere in my desire. I'm sincere in what we want. We're hungry for the real, but the Bible gives distinct instruction. If somebody would have just went back and read, we're so easily to look around to see what everybody else is doing. 
Well, if they're doing it, it'll work for us. If, if they're singing it, it'll work for us. If they're trying it, it will work for us. Where did David learn to put the ark on a cart? Because that's what the Philistines did. He learned to put the ark of God on a cart by looking at what the enemy did. If he would have just looked back a little bit and said, how did God intend this from the very beginning? God said, listen, if my presence is going to be moving, I'm putting four corners on the edge of that ark. And there's going to be some staves that go through that ark. And it's going to be picked up under the shoulders of men. The ark of God was never, it was never designed to be put upon a, a cart. It was always designed to be felt under the burden on the shoulders of men. It doesn't matter what they're doing. It doesn't matter what another church is doing. It doesn't matter what the mega church is doing. Just because they're doing it doesn't mean that we do it. The presence of God bears a responsibility and we have to feel the weight of the presence of God. Hallelujah. Let's go with me. I'm feeling something right now. Exodus 25 and verse 10. This is what David could have went back and looked. And they shall make an ark of shit of wood. Two cubits and a half shall the length thereof. And a cubic and a half the breadth thereof. And the cubic and the height of the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within. And without shalt thou overlay it. And thou shalt make upon it a crown of gold around about it. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it. And put them in the four corners thereof. And and, and two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other and thou shalt make staves of the shit of wood and overlay them with gold and thou shalt put the staves into the rings of the side of the ark that the ark may be born with them God gave instructions when you move my presence it's going to be carried upon the shoulders of men I feel the Holy Ghost. The enemy always wants you to do what's convenient. Let's put the presence of God on an ark. Let's roll it in here and roll it out when we want. But God said, oh no, from the very beginning, if you want my presence, you're going to feel the pressure. If you want my presence, you're going to feel the responsibility. If you want my presence, you're going to feel the weight. Of the words, it doesn't matter the song you sing. It doesn't matter the instruments you have. It doesn't matter the screens on the wall. It doesn't matter the building that you're worshiping in. If you want the real move of the Holy Ghost, you're going to feel something. You're going to feel the burden. You're going to feel the weight of my presence. We just don't roll it in when we want to. It's all right. Let me declare into this congregation today the presence of God doesn't need a new cart. The presence of God needs and what it has always needed is to be carried and to feel the responsibility upon the shoulders of men and women. Sunday school teachers that feel a burden. Singers that feel a burden. Preachers that feel a burden. Saints in the pew that feel a burden. If you want the real genuine presence of Almighty God, you you're going to feel the weight of my presence. Hey, Shataya da Bohoya. Hey, Yatobo Shahaya. Come on, let's worship for just a moment. Hallelujah. Somebody going to get a burden in this house today. Somebody going to be here early tomorrow for prayer. Somebody's going to linger in the presence of the Lord tonight in your home. Somebody's going to find a prayer closet before they go to bed. Somebody's going to gather the family around before we shut our eyes tonight. It won't be the TV that puts us to sleep tonight. It's going to be the presence of God that puts us to sleep. It won't be a video game tonight. It won't be the meal that puts us to sleep. But the holy power of the Almighty God is going to come into our homes. We're going to sleep like we've never slept before. We're going to wake up with the desire to serve God like we've never felt before because we understand if God's going to move the real presence of God has to be born on the shoulders of me. Hallelujah. Look what Numbers 
chapter 7 and verse 1. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove to you and I'm going to hurry to a close. I'm going to prove to you. And this is number 7 and verse 1. And it came to pass on the day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle and had anointed it and sanctified it and all the instruments thereof, both the altar and all the vessels thereof, and had anointed them and sanctified them, that the princes of Israel, heads of the house of their fathers, who were the princes of the tribes and who were them that were numbered, offered, and they brought their offering before the Lord. Look here. And they brought their offering before the Lord, six covered wagons, 12 oxen, a wagon for two of the princes and one for the ox, and they brought them before the tabernacle. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take it of them, that they may be able to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. And thou shalt give unto the Levites, to every man, according to his service. And Moses took the wagons and the oxen and gave them to the Levites, two wagons and four oxen gave to the sons of Gershon, according to their service. And four wagons and eight oxen he gave unto the sons of Moriah, according to their service, and to the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. Verse nine, but unto the sons of Korah he gave none because the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them was that they should bear upon their shoulders. My God, it doesn't seem fair when everybody else gets a cart. It doesn't look fair when the person beside you has the oxen and their responsibility seems to be easier than yours. But to Korah, to the sons of Korah, to those that are responsible for the presence of God, you ain't getting a wagon. You ain't getting an oxen. If you're going to get God to move, then you're going to feel the responsibility. If you're going to get his presence in the house, then you're going to... Oh, I'm preaching to somebody right now. Let us have an easier way. God said, oh no, give the oxen, give the wagons to everybody else. But for those that are responsible for the presence of God, you are going to feel the weight. Come on, when they're having a picnic, give them a wagon. When it's a men's fishing trip, give them a wagon. Give them a few more oxen. Put some mag wheels on that, on that wagon. Make it look good. And when, it's a, when it's a lady's time to have a Tupperware party, I mean to tell you what, load the wagons up and have a good time. But when it comes to Sunday morning service, you better put your wagons to the side. When it comes time to preach, it comes time to teach, it comes time for an altar call, you better park your wagon somewhere else because your wagons cannot bring in the presence of God. If the presence of God is going to come, you're going to have to get under the weight of the responsibility of that presence. But, but, but that, but that, but that, that, that ark's going to mess up the way I look. But that ark's going to make me walk a little different. But, but that ark, bearing that ark's going to wrinkle my nice suit. It's, it's, gonna make, it's not going to make me look cool when I, when I walk in and it's four of us together like that. We ain't going to look as sharp as everybody else. God said it don't matter what you look like. It's all, it matters what I look like. It doesn't matter what other people think about you. It matters what I think about you. And just for the record, when my presence gets there, everything else goes to the side. So you just keep marching. You keep walking with the presence of the Lord. You bear under your shoulders the responsibility of the presence of Almighty God. But that's not what they're doing. That's why their services are dead. But that's not what the that's not what the mega church is doing. That's why they're just coming in and, and bringing their coffee cup into the sanctuary and saying a few amens and putting their hundred dollars in the in the offering and walking out. And they ain't got no joy. They ain't got no peace. They ain't got no victory. I, 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 listen to me. I'm not knocking anybody today that may be struggling with some of that. But we're not interested in being the coolest church in town. We're not interested in being the hippest church in town. We're not interested in singing. We don't, it don't matter if we sing Amazing Grace or the latest song. It does not matter. As long as we have the presence of God, as long as the supernatural is in operation, as long as, oh my God, people get up out of wheelchairs, people give diagnosis of cancer, but the doctor says you've been cleared. People that are addicted, people that are depressed, set free. 
by the presence of God. Cora, I can see the sons of Cora walking up to Abraham, walking up to Moses, excuse me. Moses, I, I, did the budget committee not put enough money in? Did, 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 the, did the dealership run out of wagons? Did, well, well I, don't, I don't see. Did, did somebody, not, somebody not give enough this week? We weren't able to buy some few more oxen, another wagon. Moses looked and said, you boys don't get a wagon. Well, what do you mean we don't get a wagon? Don't, don't you know everything we got to do? Yeah, I know what you got to do. I know what you got to move. I know what you got to do. I know you gotta, how you got to operate. But you guys are going to be a little bit more tired on Sunday than everybody else. When everybody else is at the lunch table and they're talking about what they're going to do on Monday, you're dragging into the house and pulling your, pulling your shoes off and putting your feet up on them, saying, oh my God, how are we going to get ready for next week? The only difference between you and them is they rode their wagon to church, but you walked to church. Well, what do you mean we don't get a wagon? Moses said, you ain't getting no wagon because you're responsible for the presence of the Lord. You're responsible, and if you're gonna get the presence of the Lord there, you're gonna feel that responsibility. You're gonna feel that weight. You don't wanna know why that man right there prays? You wanna know why that man and woman right there pray in the Holy Ghost when nobody else is looking because they want the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost? He possesses enough ability and talent to get up here and just share and just share but if we want God in this house if we want miracles in this house if we want signs and wonders in this house somebody, somebody has got to get under the weight of the presence and the responsibility hallelujah I'm almost done. God's about to take over. But there is no latest and greatest move of God. There is no latest. Get your wagons out for everything else. Try something new for everything else in the church. But when it comes to the presence of God, it is still going to be carried upon the shoulders of man. My presence is moved under a burden. You cannot sing it down. You cannot put enough lights up to make it happen. You cannot be cool enough. You cannot be hip enough. If you are truly wanting a move of God it's because somebody feels the responsibility I mentioned it in the first session we used to walk into our church in Nashville. I don't know how long I've been going here. Let me, oh man, I've been going a long time. We used to walk into our church in Nashville and out in Old Hickory, we had a, it was, it was a two-story church, but there was on the third floor, right above the, right above the platform was these two little rooms, a little bitty narrow, uh, I'm not kidding I, I don't know if I can get up it now, but it was a narrow walkway. Brother Chuck knows what I'm talking about. And up there in this, uh, in this uh, 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 two rooms, it was an old PAW church, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. And, and it was red carpet on the floor, red carpet, but fuzzy carpet, red fuzzy carpet. Chuck, you know what I'm talking about. Brother Chuck, I'm sorry. Red fuzzy carpet. And, and, the, and, the, and Donald Lance was in our church at that time. And Brother Chuck was in our church at that time. We was all just boys. We was all 14, 15, 16 years old. And, and uh, Brother Chuck's a little bit older than I am, so uh, Brother Donald's a little bit older than him. So I guess Brother Donald would have probably been 17 or 18, so that would have made me probably 14, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in that. Brother Marshall, before church, the men would gather in those two little rooms upstairs. They wouldn't bigger in a minute. I can't tell you how many times, how many times church didn't start on time because the drummer and the piano player and the song leader was still in the presence of the Lord. And if you wore a blue or black suit, you could tell if you'd been in the prayer room because that little red fuzzy would be all over your knees. And if you was to lay down, you just got a new design. That's the way I was raised up. 
I, I can hear it in my head right now. My dear friend, Pastor Donald Lance, who pastors in Jackson. I can hear him walking into the church an hour before church started. And he was already there an hour in the prayer rooms begging God, come by here, Lord. I'm talking about it would seem like for 30 minutes he would never say anything else. But come by here, God. Come by here, Lord. Come by here, Lord. Come by here, Lord. It doesn't matter how good we are. We, we, become, so, we become so professional. We become so talented. And there's nothing wrong with that. I believe that God wants us to be the best we can be. If you're going to play, I think you should be the best. I don't think you should get up there and miss your notes and wonder what in the world's going on. And, and all. I think you should do the best you can do. If you're going to preach, I think you need to be prepared. But let me tell you something. In your preparation, don't forget to pray. In your preparation, in your practice, don't forget to stop by the prayer closet and say, oh God, this is just words on an iPad unless you come in. But if we can get your presence in here, there'll be a release of the power like we have never experienced before. Listen, if we knew the spirits that were sitting among us right now, what people are battling in this place right now, if you feel that God has called you to a certain ministry, if you're a teacher, a preacher, a singer, musician, leader, whatever that may be, you cannot be effective without prayer. I know it's hard. I know it takes time. I know you don't have a wagon. I'm sorry, brother. You don't have a wagon. But look at there. Oh, admire their wagon. That's fine. You can look around, you walk out there and brag on their wagon. Maybe go for a ride in their wagon. I don't know. Enjoy their wagon. Enjoy everybody else's wagon. When it comes to you, no wagon. No wagons. No oxen and no wagons. You're going to feel this. You want to know why you feel exhausted on Sunday? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You get, you get finished preaching on Sunday. You work in the altar. You get to the restaurant, you don't feel like eating, but you know you need to eat. You get home and you're so physically exhausted. You lay in the bed and your mind races for two hours because you're worried about this one that wasn't there. And I wish they'd have come to the altar. You want to know why you feel that? Because you don't have a wagon. I'm just getting under the presence. God, I want you to move today. Oh, oh, it's uncomfortable. But God, if you're going to move, your presence has to be ushered in on the shoulders of men. The problem is this, is not to ever to be on a cart. Ox was born to carry weight. The ark, listen, the ark, the, the ark was not a problem to the ox. He could have carried it with no problem. No problem. He was born to carry weight. The problem was is when humanity didn't feel the presence of God. It wasn't the ox's responsibility to feel the burden of the presence of God. It was humanity's responsibility to feel the burden of the presence of God. Can we stand together? And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of that place, at the name of that place, Pezeruah, to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord. He said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to us? So David would not remove the ark. But David carried it inside the house of Obadiah, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued to the house of Obadiah, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed him. <laughs> The Bible says David carried it. I don't know how, I don't know how they got it in the house, but somebody picked that ark up and carried it. And God said, this is what I've been waiting on the whole time. It don't matter what house it sets in, it will be blessed. Wherever. That lets us know, my God, it's not just a king's blessing. Obadiah's house was just on the side of the road. 
Obadiah's house is just a house of convenience. Man, the Lord has given me that right there. You don't have to be somebody big, somebody impressive, some big name to have the presence of the Lord in your house. Obadiah's house is the closest. Let's take it in there. And God said, when they carried it in there the right way, wherever my presence is, there's going to be blessing. Obadiah would have never been known if his house just wasn't convenient. The Bible says the Lord blessed all the house of Obadiah. So David went and brought the ark of the Lord from the house of Obadiah into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they bare the ark of the Lord, they had gone six paces. He sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. When we get it right, when we are singing under the anointing, when we are preaching under the anointing, when we are leading under the anointing. We are teaching that Sunday school class under the burden of anointing. When we're singing on the platform or playing an instrument or leading that department, when you feel no burden, you are mishandling the presence of God. So it's better to resign. I'm not trying to get you in trouble. It's better to resign when you have no burden than to mishandle the responsibility of the Lord. Give it to somebody that will go to Obadinam's house and say, we're going to carry this out. We're going to make sure, Lord Jesus, we come before you. If we can lift our hands all over this building. Pastor's coming right now. He's going to pray. But I want us to pray before he ever takes a mic right now. Can we begin to pray? all over this house in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Lift your voices to him right now. God, I pray that this word will go so deeply into our spirit. What a life-changing day, God, but we don't want it just to change us right now. We want, it, we want to keep the change. God, I pray. Oh, as we start this year, let what has been spoken to us in both of these sessions. Set the, set the temperature of where we are. Let us, let us just make this our marching order for 2021. And we're, we're going to be people of prayer, God. We cannot live without your presence. God, we cannot live without your presence. Come on, talk to him in your own way. Talk to him in your own way. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living God. Your presence, Lord. I have tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord 
Put your hands in the air if you're comfortable doing that and just bask in his presence. Absolutely incredible. God's presence, God's word. Make sure you greet Brother and Sister Bats and tell them how on time they were for us today. For those who are online, thank you for joining us. We've got good news, bad news, and then some good news. So the good news is you were here today. Bad news is, 
he won't be here tomorrow. So if you're listening, please don't be offended here. There's a subset in every congregation that say, you know, I like Brother Batson. It's kind of cold today. I'm going to sit by the fire. I'll catch him tomorrow. Not this time. Good news is he's going to be back in November, good Lord willing, for Senior Saint Sunday. He's not a senior saint. The speakers always laugh. They think we're calling them senior saints. Our senior saints, just if we're going to honor them, we better have church. And we're going to have church and we're going to honor them. And I'm so thrilled about them being back. Thank you, God. Oh, my goodness. My heart's just full. I'm going to tell you something. I normally don't preach after going to conferences because you hear like 10 messages. And I come back pretty excited. But it's like throwing in the hopper and go, you know. So I'm pretty excited. It was on one topic. So we're, we're pretty good. This, this is not a conference, but it feels like one to me. My heart is as full as if we went to Because of the Times. Thank you for being here. Greet the Batsons. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow at 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock for a great time in the presence of the Lord. Thank you so very much. Thanks to the Nooners for live streaming. Brother Robertson uh, is here. He's stuck behind the, uh, he's hid among the stuff back there, but he's here. Brother Michael, thank you for your great help. God, God bless you and be dismissed in Jesus' name.